Our first speaker on this track is Aaron Havaron, and he's going to guide us through the galaxy, so make sure you listen carefully to what he has to say. Hmm. Uh, hi there, my name is Aaron Haravon. I am a software engineer. Um, I work as a principal uh, software architect and SRE lead in an um, Israeli high-tech startup called Nuvo Group. Nuvo Group um, develops uh, cloud-based medical devices for remote pregnancy monitoring. It is both my pleasure and my honor to be giving this talk today. Um, uh, in Belgrade. Uh, Belgrade is my birthplace uh, where I grew up and studied, so it has that special place in my heart. Uh, my objective in giving this talk today is to share some of my insights with community members of various expertise levels. Uh, um, I hope to provide each of you with at least uh, one uh, piece of information that will be worth your attention. Um, uh, we will start with a brief personal and Kubernetes introduction, and then uh, we'll see um, CNCF landscape categories, mentioning a few examples from each of the category. So, uh, during the past decades, I worked in Israeli high-tech startups on development of medical devices, web analytics, intelligence, and other systems that are in a worldwide use. Uh, in, technical, in those technical leadership roles, uh, I had an opportunity to get to know the advantages and disadvantages of various, uh, of big uh, part of open source uh, uh, stack uh, for security, storage, reliable data processing, and similar. Uh, uh, in this talk, I will be briefly present the cloud native tech stack that I've been using in recent years that is both up to date and provides solutions to most, uh, uh, to big part of business requirements common to most software projects. When I was a kid, I used to spend lots of my time with Commodore 64 computer. Back then, achieving even a simple effect such as coloring a specific pixel on the screen with an arbitrary color could turn out to be a non-trivial task. The challenge here was that you had to use the so-called palette of colors to set the pixel color, and the palette had only sufficient space to keep the selection of 16 out of the 256 columns. So to overcome this limitation of 16 colors and display an image in full 256 colors, you had to program the control of the change of the cathode ray tube uh, screen's electron beam each time uh, it passes 16 pixels. So the primary source of information were books and articles in computer magazines, so you couldn't just easily adopt an existing solution. Uh, this illustrates the kinds of challenges we had to deal with when solving problems with computers back in the time. Now, let's fast forward in time, almost, almost 40 years to today. We now live in an era in which we have numerous open source projects, many of them aiming at helping us address those common challenges. According to the GitHub Wikipedia page, there are 28 million public repositories as of uh, June 2022 uh, on GitHub. Yeah? So the challenge has over time shifted from having to know each and every technical detail to knowing uh, the already existing uh, elements of a vast puzzle and how each of them maps to our uh, real world business requirements. Then we need to integrate the required systems and develop our own uh, software around the selected technology stack, as you know it. So the applications I'll be talking about here today uh, run in the Kubernetes environment. They, use, uh, they rely on it to implement important business uh, requirements such as uh, high availability and auto-scaling in a cloud vendor agnostic way and with support for both uh, cloud uh, on-premises and hybrid scenarios. Um, being able to run on your own instances as opposed to Lambda and such uh, allows for cost reduction and better latencies. Being able to run on multiple clouds provides for better positions in cloud cost negotiations with a vendor and uh, for um, uh, and also, as well, uh, for better resilience, of course, because uh, so uh, being able to run in hybrid scenarios allows for further cost reduction and performance improvements uh, where you can uh, run part of the workload on your uh, strong servers, on your private data centers. So Kubernetes is an industry standard platform to achieve those qualities. Throughout this talk, wherever AWS related software uh, components or services are mentioned, uh, other cloud vendors uh, provide similar uh, replacements. So let's notice that the service on which the applications run, the so-called Kubernetes nodes, do occasionally restart. 
the Linux kernel updates in certain Kubernetes maintenance operations require restarting the computers. Uh, furthermore, we ideally want to support the utilization of spot instances that are cheaper to run, uh, but may be terminated with a short notice. Okay, so how do we achieve high availability in such uh, a dynamic environment? So as a general rule, we use multiple pods uh, to, se to serve the same service and we use uh, some sort of uh, replicated data storage. So when we're starting the nodes, we usually do so one by one. Therefore, there is always another pod, unaffected pod, running uh, the same service as the pods on the restarted node. So to ensure the high availability of a cloud native, applica cloud native application, we need to make sure to configure the affinity pod topology spread constraints and pod to, uh, disruption budgets. If we fail, for example, to configure the affinity and only configure the replica numbers to two, we may end up running both uh, pods on the same uh, node and therefore still having a non-reliable single point of failure. So for scalability, there are three types of tools, uh, horizontal and vertical pod autoscaling and vertical and uh, cluster autoscaling, sorry. So uh, horizontal pod autoscaling is adjusting the number of replicas of Kubernetes application according to the current load. The cluster autoscaling is automated attaching and detaching of uh, Kubernetes nodes to our cluster. And the vertical pod autoscaling uh, is actually automated adjusting, adjusting of the pod CPU and memory requirements. It's less used uh, in reality, I think. Uh, anyways, in this image, we have two services, um, blue and yellow, served by pods on Kubernetes nodes. Uh, the amount of pods is suitable to the system load at the moment. But then after a while, the processing load changes its pattern and the number of the required blue pods grew up uh, significantly while the number of the yellow pods shrank to only two. So this automated adjustment of the number of pods is the horizontal pod autoscaling. Now let's note these, those pending pods without nodes to run on. Cluster autoscaling refers to automated attaching and detaching nodes to the uh, cluster as required by the existing workload, the pods. So in this way, the horizontal pod autoscaling and cluster autoscaling work together to adjust the cluster size according to the load requirements, actual load requirements at the, at the particular moment. So Kubernetes uh, comes with a built-in horizontal pod autoscaling functionality. Uh, it is a powerful tool, but it is a bit complex to configure and uh, it is uh, under constant development. For example, um, when scaling an application down in a long running task scenarios, it makes sense to take out those pods that completed the work and not those still uh, doing, doing the work that are busy. Yeah? So Kubernetes introduced the pod deletion cost annotation so that uh, application can uh, uh, communicate this information back to it only last year in the version 121. So CADA is a popular companion to HPA uh, with many event sources, uh, therefore simplifying autoscaling configuration when it is applicable. Uh, cluster you may use the cluster proportional autoscaler uh, for uh, scaling the services that their load is dependent, uh, dependent on the number of the Kubernetes nodes, such as Kubernetes internal DNS and observability stack services. Yeah? Uh, Kubernetes has the cluster autoscaling project for the cluster autoscaling needs. It supports multiple cloud vendors and on AWS, uh, it's uh, relying on the functionality called AWS autoscaling groups. Uh, to overcome uh, some of the limitation of the cluster autoscaler, you may use the open source Carpenter project uh, to have a fine grained control of the percentages of spots and on demand in an instance group. And to have a nice user interface, you may use commercial services such as Spot.io. Um, use the scheduler project to keep your pot topology spread constraints satisfied despite their neglection by the replica set controller. Uh, at least until the issue is rectified. If running in AD, uh, on AWS, make use of the AWS node termination handler uh, uh, to uh, timely and gracefully handle uh, the EC2 termination notices. And use a node problem detector to, to troubleshoot node-related issues in your cluster. Uh, before we continue, on our cloud native journey through the galaxy, uh, I'd like to notice that many tech logos are, look somewhat water related. I wonder why is that? Anybody has an idea why is that? Okay, maybe it's because of the sea? Who knows? 
<laughs> okay, so this was a programmer joke, no one laughs, that's okay. So, uh, uh, while Docker was previously the main Kubernetes container runtime, uh, most of them uh, shift, most environments shifted towards CRIO and container D today. So uh, while evaluating CNI plugins, it is important to know that not all of them support the network policies uh, feature. Uh, one commonly used uh, CNI plugin that does is called Calico. And a uh, funnel plugin may be sufficient if all you need is pod connectivity in a private data center. And AWS VPC CNI is okay to use in the same sense when you're running in AWS cloud. Um, Cilium CNI plugin has some serious advanced features. Uh, it's, uh, it has a, like a application level uh, network policies based on, for example, Cassandra table or a Kafka topic. Uh, and it has also network connections visualization in its Hubble UI. Uh, so you can combine uh, Cilium or Calico with your, if you have Flannel or AWS VPC CNI to get their advantages without replacing the existing CNI plugin if that is a problem for your production cluster. Uh, ingress controllers, decision matrix should include supported protocols, um, load balancing features, authentication methods, traffic distribution, DDoS protection, uh, WAF features, uh, and so on. So basically, basically those features. Uh, most in, uh, ingress controllers are based on Nginx, Envoy, Haproxy, or uh, traffic being an exception. Uh, and if you, if you do not have any particular specific requirements from your proxy, then for Kubernetes ingress projects may be uh, suitable for you. Um, the recently introduced Gateway API um, is kind of a new version of the ingress model based on the services, uh, based on the um, several newly defined CRDs. Uh, main advantages of the Gateway API uh, include uh, support for uh, more uh, deployment scenarios and uh, better portability when switching between uh, Ingress uh, or Gateway controllers. Um, the portability is achieved through an expressive model that eliminates the need for extensive use of controller-specific attributes we had to uh, uh, do when working with Ingress controllers. So to secure the internal services for additional layer of security, uh, you, like uh, you may use uh, the two ingress controllers, uh, one associated with the load balancer and the other one on a private utility subnet. Sorry, if the slide broke. Um, so um, uh, in this way, you, you, you add actually additional sec uh, security layer by exposing the internal services only on your VPN network. So uh, to provision network load balancers uh, for services of type load balancer, Kubernetes sh today in AWS should use the AWS Cloud Controller Manager or even better AWS Load Balancer Controller. Um, when running in a private data center, Metal LB will come in handy as a cloud native NLB solution. Uh, the in-tree uh, kubeDNS uh, implementation called uh, uh, for service discovery was replaced by core DNS in most Kubernetes environments by today. COPS project has the DNS controller for Route 53 and external DNS controller uh, can manage virtually any DNS server out there from within the Kubernetes. Uh, you may uh, want to use the AWS IAM users and roles uh, to manage the access to Kubernetes APIs combined with enforced MFA policy, uh, for, uh, this allows for both manageable and secure solution for both AWS and Kubernetes. So for pods access to AWS resources, you can use the cube to IAM. Uh, uh, you can use cube to IAM, uh, it, which automates the assuming of the AWS IAM roles based on uh, the annotations on the pod. And, um, the most up-to-date way to manage the AWS access, uh, the pod access to AWS, is to use the uh, to use the, the mapping between the IAM roles and the service accounts. This way, the cluster operators have uh, best control. Um, I have uh, I've had a good experience using Rook to provision Ceph-backed uh, persistent volumes uh, and object storage on a private cloud, on a private uh, on-premises in private data center. Another popular solution for that purpose is open EBS. Um, in cloud scenarios, cloud uh, providers offer their own CSI driver um, that works with their uh, block device storage uh, cloud service. Uh, um, 
there's not much debate today about which source code control to use. It is the obvious choice. Uh, same uh, goes for uh, managing your open source projects. Uh, most of them are in GitHub, so best to keep your open source projects there as well. The open source GitLab Community Edition can live within the QR Kubernetes cluster and manage your private repositories uh, from there. It's a great tool and uh, developers just love it, so uh, there is no reason really not to use it. For uh, container image building from within the Kubernetes, Kaniko does the job just fine. Uh, the container repo shipped along with the GitLab is actually Docker registry, and uh, Harbor is another popular Docker, uh, uh, not Docker, but container registry uh, solution, project. Um, so uh, uh, to store for the library and operating system packages, you can use the JFrog Artifactory open source edition. And GitLab also has uh, support for various uh, package repositories. Um, so uh, Helm is de facto standard for packaging uh, Kubernetes applications and Chalk Museum is of course a repository for them. And Packers is, uh, Packer is a useful tool when you need to build virtual machine images such as AMIs. Uh, SolarCube Community Edition uh, will perform static code analysis of your code to uh, allow for early uh, detection of code quality and security issues. Uh, um, another open source uh, project called Claire uh, will scan your containers uh, for operating system repo uh, with the reported uh, vulnerabilities like CVs and stuff. So uh, Pluto. Uh, is a lifesaver tool when you're planning Kubernetes upgrade. So it will scan your installed Kubernetes uh, Helm charts and it will warn you about the usage of an obsolete APIs in the following versions. So make sure to, you, to run it before you upgrade your cluster, you may kill it. Uh, Cosign uh, can be used for signing and verification of container images provenance within the CI, uh, within the CI. and Connoisseur uh, can be used for the same purpose, like for the origin, uh, for origin-related uh, policies, uh, application within enforcement within your cluster. So uh, the so-called EFK stack is sufficient uh, to have the complete in-cluster log uh, shipping, transformation, storage, uh, and uh, analytics, and alerting as well. So add Kafka to the game to add better support for uh, log picks, uh, log a month. Um, uh, log amount picks. Um, Prometheus is a pretty uh, much standard piece of Kubernetes to handle the metrics. Uh, and uh, Grafana is uh, used to create beautiful dashboards over those metrics. Uh, both tools have their own ways on, uh, for creating alerts based on those metrics and net data. Uh, this is like a logo of NetData, it's a Greek, uh, a Greek startup. Uh, they provide a great open source project for uh, real-time metrics. Um, out of the box with zero configuration, you get like 3,000 metrics. A really, really nice tool. You should have it. Uh, to instantly get deep insights about the service uh, communication flows and timings for your own application, uh, you, you can use the open telemetry drop-in. You just put a, a jar of what you, you got into your project and boom, you get it. Like you just add the Jaeger operator, it will handle the rest by creating the required stack for storing um, and searching and visualizing the uh, traces of your application. It provides a convenient user interface to, uh, for drilling uh, down into uh, inter-service communication map with contextual level information. Falco will get you informed about suspicious events in your cluster. Um, it does so by, imply, by applying a set of uh, pre-configured uh, but customizable uh, uh, rules uh, that apply to uh, um, uh, syslogs, Linux syscalls, uh, as well as audit logs uh, from both your Kubernetes cluster and your cloud vendor. I think in this case only, only AWS. Uh, Cert Manager is another uh, must-have in your cluster uh, to uh, securely and uh, for all secure and automated management of certificates. And uh, check out Open Policy Agent if you have advanced authentication uh, authorization. Sorry, rules. Uh, so you can adopt the open policy agent to adopt actually the standard language for definition of those authorization rules. Um, Keycloak will satisfy most projects uh, as a single sign solution running inside the cluster. Um, it has an advanced operator the, so that performs backups and upgrades 
so it's easy to use. Uh, many uh, companies uh, choose to use software as a service, such as O0 and Okta, for this purpose. When selecting a classic OLTP database uh, for your cluster, make sure that it comes with an advanced operator uh, with it. Yeah? So that way you will get uh, management UI, database backups, point-in-time recovery, replication failover, uh, maintenance, upgrades, along with CRDs to manage all of these from within the Kubernetes. Uh, you can use, uh, 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 with Vitesse, you get all of these uh, plus sharding support from MySQL. Uh, for Postgres, the uh, you may use the Crunchy Data or the PostgreSQL uh, Postgres operator, both lagging behind uh, when compared to, what, uh, compared to what Vitesse has to offer for MySQL. Uh, when outside the area of the uh, classic OLTP databases in a big dat data arena, uh, you may select the database, you should select database uh, carefully according to your particular use cases. So, uh, for example, if challenged by a highly concurrent workload of relatively small queries, you may use Cassandra. Or when you're doing the big data analytics, you will probably consider Druid database. If you're doing graphs, you may want to use Neo4j or maybe even Redis that is usually used for uh, uh, cache and queues, but it also supports uh, graphs processing. Um, uh, when challenged by a stream processing ch uh, task, uh, business requirement, uh, the, you can implement it, uh, if you can implement it using, the SQ, using an SQL language, then that is most probably the shortest uh, path to the solution. Uh, in that case, uh, you may, for example, use the KSQL DB uh, or Flink SQL or Spark SQL and, uh, and then uh, run this SQL-like statement against the streams running through a Kafka topic, for example. Uh, when the stream processing cannot be modeled in SQL language, then you can uh, turn to modeling it using uh, uh, using uh, code, like uh, uh, for example in Java with Kafka streams, uh, or in uh, Python with PyFlink or PySpark. Um, there are numerous, numerous data visualization tools out there. Uh, but uh, Metabase, uh, Superset, and Redash are outstanding with their community size and their features. Jupyter is a great tool to present your API, your library, or a data science research. And Redi uh, Streamlit can be used to rapidly create data-driven uh, interfaces in Python. To provide the full cloud-native experience for Kafka, you, may need to, you should use the StreamZ operator unless you have a, a commercial Kafka op, uh, which comes with an operator. And the popular broker called uh, RabbitMQ comes uh, out with the operator out of the box. Um, if you are looking uh, for extreme speeds and you may allow to lose some messages, you can use NUT's, uh, NUT's PubSub uh, transport system. And if you're working with MQTT, you can use RabbitMQ uh, MQTT plugin or EMQX open source solution. Uh, workflow engines uh, help us imp implement ETL, uh, data processing, machine learning, maintenance pipelines, and similar. Uh, while there are many options out there, I've mostly seen people use Airflow, Luigi, and Argo. Uh, Prefect is uh, like uh, uh, the newest tool on, on the block. And um, uh, while Argo is declarative uh, and based on uh, Kubernetes CRDs, uh, Luigi, Airflow, and Prefect use Python for workload definition. Uh, service mesh solutions will add visibility for uh, and some additional layer of security, like uh, mutual TLS, uh, for your microservices without uh, any need for code change. Uh, if you think we've mentioned uh, too many projects during this talk, then think again. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this was only a small part of a ridiculously uh, packed, dense, uh, dense packed slide uh, available on Landscape uh, CNCF IO. You should visit if you haven't. Uh, uh, so this is only a small selection 
of all of these tools from the CNCF uh, side. And, and this CNCF landscape is only a small selection of all the open source tools that are available for us to use. So being able to utilize this cloud native stack is almost a super power, power because it enables uh, you to create a, 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 a creation of production systems capable of efficiently serving the whole world in a short time by small teams. I hope this lecture provided you with some useful pointers relevant to your product or project. If you, uh, and that it will motivate you to further explore uh, the cloud native uh, software galaxy. This is a short mention of the used graphic sources and you can reach me at the email shown here for more in-depth insights related to CNCF stack tools. You should check out the Kubernetes podcast uh, from Google. Uh, and if you like this presentation, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel called Guide to the Landscape. I just opened it a few days ago. By the way, the channel logo was created by OpenAI's DALI2. Um, like yesterday, um, uh, during the breaks, I will uh, I will walk around the conference hall. Uh, so feel free to, to approach me and ask any questions if you may have. Thank you very much for your attention.